Monday and welcome to another reading vlog. I have a nice cup of coffee and I did quite a lot of reading this weekend so um, I have some books to discuss with you guys. So a book I've started listening to is an historical fiction which I haven't read in a while so I was really looking forward to it and I started listening to The Mercies by Kieran Millwood Hargrave. I think she is an English writer and this historical fiction plays out in the 17th century I believe in, in Finland or somewhere in Scandinavia. I'm not even sure if it's a fantastical or a real place but I do think it is like historical fiction without the magical elements but I can never really be sure with these fun historical fictions. Although fun I'm not sure if it's a good word because this book is very dark, sometimes harsh to read because of the descriptions. I think I can compare it to The Silence of the Girls, the way that was harsh but still very beautiful and interesting. So this story is about an island where only I think a few hundred people live and the men of the island go on boats to fish and they all get killed on the boat, which means there are no more men on the island and the women have to fend for themselves. So that works out for a while and then someone sends a Scottish missionary, I believe, to their island. We have one storyline from the women on the island and we have one storyline from that missionary and his wife, from the perspective of his wife. And I think the silence of the girls part really fits in with uh, with the experience that his wife has from traveling through, I think, Norway to that small island, which I think she describes it as much farther north than she has ever been and that she's actually willing to go. But her father says, here, there's a husband for you to marry and she marries him. So I'm listening to the audiobook, which I'm mainly liking, but when an English narrator does an accent in an audiobook that just it feels a little bit annoying to me. Of course, it's written in English, but if people would speak in their own language, like Norwegian, they wouldn't have an accent. They would speak just flawless Norwegian. So why would you use a Norwegian accent in English? It doesn't make a lot of sense. I am now one third in of the mercies and it's really nice and chill to just listen to because uh, for this weekend I had a migraine. It wasn't that bad, I could still read, but having a chill and interesting and escapism audiobook is just the absolute best. Something totally different I also started reading, which I didn't expect. I would really be in the mood for this weekend, but I started reading and I just couldn't stop. And that is The Ways by Virginia Woolf. This is about six friends who grow up together and apart separate, but mainly together. We have the perspective changes, like in the same way that you have in Mrs. Dalloway, that it just flows over one another. And it can be a little bit confusing with six characters. I am annotating it with giving every character its own color. So we have Rhoda, Susan, Bruno, Neville, Louis and Ginny. Like you can see I have had some tabs with just beautiful things they say because I had a phone call with my dad yesterday and I told him this book is like the form is prose. It has just the way uh, the sentences are built, the way you know the page uh, looks. It's all prose but when you're reading it you have the feeling that you're reading poetry and that's just it's so intense, it's so gripping, it's so beautiful and with most Virginia Woolf books it's a little bit hard to get into. So I put on the audiobook while I was reading on my own reading speed and then I was just reading along and that really helped me to stay into this because I think especially when the chapter starts we have a nature description in which especially waves and trees and birds play a very big part and that nature description is like a prediction I think from the time period of the chapter because every chapter is a jump in time. Sometimes it's a bit bigger, sometimes it's a bit smaller. We start out with the six kids being friends, adolescents, in their 20s, middle age and I think I am now starting the middle age part because I'm at page 159 and it has about 230 pages. I do think that especially the male characters look very alike. They have the same ambitions of being a writer and a poet. I think Burnett is someone I can easily separate, but Neville and Louis seem very similar to me. And sometimes I have to get back a little bit to see who's actually speaking because the only way you know who is speaking is because of these sentences. You have a perspective change when it's like, when Miss Lambert passes, said Rhoda, and then you know Rhoda is speaking. And especially with the audiobook on quite a high speed, I can sometimes miss a little bit. I have to pause it and look back. I think especially Susan, who is very different from the other characters because she doesn't like to live in the city in the art scene. She likes to be outside in nature, in the country. So her life is very different. And Ginny is quite obsessed with her looks and how she is 
seen by the world around her. They are kind of very different and Bernard is very obsessed also I think with perception and his father is Australian and you can hear that he has a bit of an Australian accent and he is incredibly obsessed with that. I think the male characters in general are quite privileged and annoying a little bit. They definitely represent these imperialistic values. I know Virginia Woolf doesn't treat those uh, subjects very well in general. She, I think she was definitely inspired by previous writers and how they thought about that and I def don't think she was socially critical on that aspect and you can notice that in this book, especially through the eye of the male characters. I think the female characters not so much because it's just not really a subject for them. They have one friend in common called Percival and Percival goes to India and he dies there. I think, I don't remember which character this was, but it's definitely one of the male characters. I think it was Neville who really imagines his arrival in India and he really idealizes Percival. They all do, but especially Neville because he's a poet who very lives within his imagination. So he he imagines what it was like in India and how Percival lived there and he definitely m makes Percival into this imperialistic king which is of course not very nice to read about but I think very telling about how this group thinks about each other and how they think about the world and sometimes when I'm reading it I feel like all these six characters are one person with different aspects on them. It's almost like Virginia Woolf based all these characters on parts of herself, but that's just me guessing and thinking that might be entirely wrong. I haven't read the introduction and the preface of this book because I know with classics it's incredibly spoilery, so I will leave that to the end and just the writing. Just I I just can't. The writing is so beautiful. It's just sentence after sentence it's just it's absolutely gorgeous and every time i read virginia wolf i just feel like creating myself and being creative i think i will finish this pretty soon because honestly i can put it down uh, which is not something i usually have with books like this but in this case i just can't put it down it's so beautiful if you think that's all the beautiful writing i'm going to dive into this week then you are very very wrong one of my 2021 goals was to read more poetry i feel like a lot of people say this i feel like i say this every year and i never do it or my tbr game starts i thought i would also pick up so Mary Oliver. This was one of your recommendations and I read a few poems. I think the poems are quite accessible and they're quite straightforward. I've read about six and yeah, I feel like reading more of this. It's beautiful, beautiful weather outside. It's spring all over. So, you know, it's this is very nature heavy, both of these. And it's just the perfect, perfect time to read this. <music> Hi, it is Tuesday evening and welcome to another episode of Can We Make a Meal Out of These Leftovers? Which honestly is one of my favorite things. It's the day before the food show. And I do have some tomato sauce, which of course this will stay good for a very long time. But I think I want to make a nice gluten-free pasta. Also, I have to feed Max because <laughs> it's really sad. Okay, I'm going to film him. He is like... Mama, you walked into the kitchen. Why are you not feeding me? Let's give you some food, mister. His food cupboard is right over there, so he's waiting for me. Okay, so yeah, let's feed Max. Okay, let's see what I have in our full-size fridge, and I'm still very happy about it. I got my lunch salad, I got some minced beef, which I can use. Some yogurt, I have a couple of tomatoes, but those are boy his snack tomatoes, so let's keep those. Let's see, vegetables. Blueberries, apples. So I can use these tomatoes. This panel is quite old, so let's use that. That's not a lot of vegetables though, so let's see what we have in the freezer. 
I think you some sweet beans. Right. Okay. Let's see. This one is still open. So I think that'd be nice in a pasta. Spinach and fennel is better together. Okay, so we have some minced beef. I think I'm going to make little uh, meatballs of that. The fennel and some spinach. And then I have some tomato sauce and some insanely expensive gluten-free pasta. I'm really not the best at spices and meat but I have some paprika powder I have some chili powder and just some salt and pepper and some cornstarch I can't eat eggs so I can't add an egg to the meatballs which I know will make it have a better consistency but we're going to roll with this I'm thinking should I also put fennel powder in the meatballs or is that too much fennel knows how to open these without uh, being sauce covered then please let me know. Uh, I'm going to try. Yeah. I wasn't sure how to spice them, but they're okay. Yeah. Hi, it's Wednesday evening. It's late, but I just finished reading the introduction to the waves after finishing it yesterday. Yesterday I finished it. And my oh my, what a book. I'm also wearing a Batman shirt because, you know, welcome in my household. But that aside, this book was so good. I think my biggest dilemma right now is deciding whether To the Lighthouse or The Waves will be my next favorite Virginia Woolf novel. What is so special about this book is that the writing is just absolutely flawless. Absolutely flawless. I think Into the Lighthouse, it may not be flawless, but the characters are insanely beautiful. And in the introduction it said that in her later work, Wolf wanted to focus more on language and the function of language instead of on the characters. And this was one of the first books in which she did that. And I can definitely notice that because the book ends with Bernard and we get to know him best. But it's not in a way that it feels like Bernard closes off the story because like I said before and it is mentioned in the introduction as well every character is every character so when we read about Bernard in the last one we also read about all the other characters because he grew up with them and he lives with them there's this one sentence that he says that just portrays that perfectly I am not one person I am many people I did not altogether know who I am Ginny, Susan, Neville, Rhoda or Louis or how to distinguish my life from theirs. So even though Bernard was picked to do the last chapter to tell the final story although plot's not important so there's not really a story to tell but we live in his last little bit but one of the things I also uh, DM'd Lucy from Crescent Pages on Instagram and I wanted to share this with her because in the introduction it is talked about the stream of consciousness and the they say, um, let's see who the introduction did. With an introduction and notes by Kate Flynn. So she said that this book and maybe Virginia Woolf's writing in general is not necessarily stream of consciousness, but a wave of consciousness where when you're reading it, uh, the wave goes up, retracts very slowly and then 
you have another wave and retracts. And that I think is how the writing feels. It is very intense and then slowly, slowly it retracts and then it comes back again with the perspective of another character and then that feels very intense and it retracts again. And that is just so beautiful and so incredibly just wow. <sighs> what else to say on this book? Oh, right. The introduction also says something about uh, the prose and poetry connection. And they have drawn a bit from her diary in which she says, I mean to eliminate all waste, deadness, superfluity, to give the moment whole, whatever it includes. And then uh, the commentator says, Wolf does not seem to have defined poetry in a formal terms concerned with versification, but to have equated it with a capacity to express intense feeling and I think that's a very very clever way of seeing how I felt in that the form is very much prose but the experience of I think especially reading free verse is what this book is and what makes the writing so incredibly gorgeous and gripping. Plot is not the most important thing but things do happen but just because of the beautiful writing and the intense intense emotion with the beautiful writing I've been on the brink of crying multiple times in this book just because of the admiration of the use of language and just I can't 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 wait to read more by Virginia Woolf. I think Jacob's Room will definitely be more character and social based um, because that was one of her earlier novels. I'm definitely going to read that but I think The Years will be incredibly interesting for me to read as well because I love To the Lighthouse and this one so much. I'm also still listening to The Mercies which is a whole other cup of tea because I am really enjoying that because of the characters and the story. I'll probably finish that before the end of the week and I'll give you a little bit of an update and because I've been sleeping absolute shit I'm not going to bed yet but I'm going to read some poems by Mary Oliver. Friday and I wanted to do some reading updates because I have been reading a little bit more of Mary Oliver. I'm now on page uh, 65 and it has about 80 pages so I have a few more poems to go which I think I will read in the reading sprints that Kira and Mary from Mary Monk Stories and Kira from Kira Foster are doing tonight. I'm not exactly sure how I feel about the poems. I think sometimes with poetry it's something that you need to hear, that you need to listen to, that someone else needs to help you a little bit to get into the rhythm and the feelings. Reading this myself, I'm not really feeling that rhythm and I'm not really feeling the flow. But I think the nature descriptions are absolutely beautiful, very detailed, very easy to visualize. And that is something I am really enjoying from Mary Oliver. But what I liked most is the whole circle of life theme in these poems. She talks a lot about how animals survive, how fish and birds eat and how they are eaten. And I think it's a beautiful way to describe survival. I think the poem is called The Fish. Let's see. Uh, yeah, The Fish, which is about her eating a fish. She says, the first fish I ever caught would not lie down, quiet in the pail, but filled and sucked at the burning amazement of the air and died. And then later she says, now the sea is in me. I am the fish. The fish glitters in me. 
we are risen, tangled together, certain to fall back into the sea. It's really quite graphic, which the other poems are not, but I thought it was beautiful to describe it that way. Also a little bit weird, but also beautiful. Another book I finished is The Mercies, which I did not expect to be so heartbreaking and so incredibly rough at times to listen to, because there are witch trials, there is love, there is abuse and murder and I did not expect this book to be so harsh, to be so rough, to be so heartbreaking and I enjoyed it for very different reasons than I expected it to because I really connected with the characters and the historical descriptions of the islands in Norway is just, it's so beautiful and I think the whole relationship between trust and expectations and betrayal is very well done and very beautifully done. I finished listening to it last night and it broke my heart. If you are an historical fiction fan I would absolutely recommend it because it's a beautiful interesting emotional historical fiction and I haven't read an historical fiction in a while so I was happy to get into that and it is kind of the genre within the historical fiction that I like where there's a lot of focus on female history and female stories and I love that in this book. I am going to start my Aerial TBR next week. If you haven't seen my TBR game yet I will link it up here and you can watch it if you like and then you can have a little bit of an overview of the books I will be reading in the vlogs to come. So thank you so much for watching and if you like this video don't forget to subscribe and I hope to see you in another one. Doei!